it's not over till it's over, right? Even if your meet is not going well, uh, your first couple races aren't aren't exactly what you what you want it to be. Uh, you know, your your next race it might be the one. Welcome to Social Kick. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got the full crew, Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and friend of the pod, Nathan Adrian. What's up, Nathan? Hey, how we doing? Thanks for having me. Man, well, thanks for coming back. It's good to see you again. And, uh, you know, you're still an aquatic guy in your uh, post, post-competitive years. What are, you, what are you doing, man? What are you up to? Um, so I still, I still run a bunch of swim lessons, um, up in San Rafael. We, uh, we run a USA team and that, that is kind of home based right now in, uh, in Petaluma. Uh, but I'm still competing a little bit. We just did a little aquatic showcase, uh, thanks to aquatics director extraordinaire at the Olympic club, uh, Bobby Savulich, um, did a little, uh, 33 and a yard, 33 and a third of a yard, uh, exhibition race this uh just a couple days ago and it was awesome what's a good time for a 33 and a third yard i don't know but i went a 13.0 and i really wanted to go 12.99 so i think next year i gotta train for it a little more uh, how, are, how how far away are you from fighting weight right now <laughs> pretty far <laughs> <laughs> i uh let, let's put it this way i um i'm i'm currently i, I haven't eaten breakfast yet because i'm gonna i'm gonna take a couple of days to do some intermittent fasting <laughs> hey the sun's coming out in california again gotta gotta get ready for it that's true you know what i honestly will say though is um i i like recently got my hands on uh like a little k box uh like eccentric training thing I like after just a couple of weeks of, of doing that eccentric training, I can just pop into our little weight room and I, I was like near personal bests on like deadlift and, and squats and everything. It's like, I'm, I'm like, I'm heavy, but I'm really pretty strong right now. I don't know. Wait, what is that? Can you describe it to me? Uh, it, Dr. John's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna think I'm an idiot <laughs> if I try, man. That's all right. Go you for. say it, you say it and then he'll break it down. <laughs> Basically, you your concentric movement. So just think about it as a as a bicep curl, right? My concentric movement is going to spin up a flywheel, and then it gets going, 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 and then at the top it comes to the end of the pulley, and then it starts spinning you back down. So it's like this really, really, really heavy um, eccentric uh, resistance at the at the top of it, and then you just try to get your full range of motion in there. And I mean, at the top, you you put in a lot of force uh, on the way up to spin up that flywheel. It's a lot of uh of force resisting you so the first couple times you got you use it i mean the classic you know 18 year old high school mistake is just to like throw on the vest and just go with the heaviest flywheel and just crank it as hard as you can but you're gonna wake up no no matter what age you are how healthy your body is you're gonna wake up so stiff yeah so you really got to take, the, and I, I learned those lessons back when we got it at, at Cal. So I, I was smart enough when I got this thing, um, you know, throw on, throw on the lightweight flywheel for the first, uh, first week or so until my body's used to it. And then you can start, you can start doing some, moving some weight after that. What do we call this early onset old man strength? Is that what you're after? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome. Well, go ahead, Luke. No, I was going to say, so I've got a pull up bar in my office and building the head there. I love it. Those straps. That's my thing. That's oh, looks like storage. That, that looks like storage, Luke. <laughs> it is storage now. It's, <laughs> my clothes and stuff. it's gonna stay. We're gonna go through the and then this is my old uh reformer I used to have. And this is my <laughs> no, but you bike. mentioned old he's, got the, he's got the whole antique gym set up that's collecting dust. I'm I sure. do, I do. I helped I helped I helped I helped Luke get a bike, and then the last time I was there at his house and I saw it, the chain was all rusty, and I'm like <laughs> yeah <laughs> man you gotta you gotta take care of that stuff so nathan i was asking uh, a, a friend of mine this morning actually uh what about pools like you got you got into the pool and clinic and club business um how do you monetize that because it just seems like you know we've all as swimmers looking for pools uh as you travel around trying to find open pools and then you had like the whole covid thing where like trying to find reserve uh, a lane a lot of times pool access is still a problem and i i don't know that i personally would look at a pool business and think oh that's you know that's a lucrative endeavor <laughs> Um, and so I'm impressed to see somebody, you know, charge that path, but I also don't know anything about the business. So I'm curious, like, 
a like how does it work but also what are the, some of the things that you've learned as you've kind of adapted and gone okay well thought that might be an opportunity but this is really like where we need to lean into if we want to make this business oh, yeah yeah really uh, <laughs> you're bringing up some painful memories brian um <laughs> we we you know initially we like looking at our business plan is is hilarious you know because we, we had to take out a loan and we were like, oh, yeah, and we'll do aqua size during the day. And then we'll do, like, these type of lessons. We'll have this massive master swim team. We'll have this going on. And, like, we basically did these projections as if we were running, you know, 10 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's just, like, we didn't have the bandwidth to do that. We didn't have the bandwidth to try to – try to. we love the master's team because it forced us to get in the water. And we just had, like – you know, you, you came up and swam with us, Brian. It was just a fun little group. But, like, it wasn't – a business endeavor it was like a mental health endeavor uh yeah. <laughs> really just just to force us to to get in and, and keep our heart rate up and, and stuff so that that really should have been mixed out of there um but really what we have found um and and this is going to be specific to anybody's area is that swim lessons are hard you know good good swim lessons are hard uh there's and there's a couple of reasons for that one um, it just takes a lot of training for an instructor to develop the feel, uh, for like finding that sweet spot of allowing the swimmer to feel their buoyancy, allowing the swimmer to feel their, their own propulsion. Um, and, and then also on the other side of that, like, you know, picking them up when, you know, the second they start like looking towards you or they start like, you know, you got to be there for a, a four-year-old that that's learning how to swim so they can grab you. You know, you don't want a, that setback of them choking on water and then, you know, you're back to square one, pouring mm -hmm. water over their head. Um, and then two, it takes a long, it takes a long time to, to train folks to do that. And they're only going to be with you, you know, a max of like three years. Maybe if you're lucky, those first two years might be in high school. And then maybe they come back one more summer before they start getting internships and stuff. Um, but the alternative to that is uh, sending high school kids to the Red Cross WSI certification and then bringing them back. And then on day one being like, here's your class ready, go. And really just kind of letting them do their thing. So, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's the thing when you, when you find swim lessons, um, at your local community center, they could be absolutely, they could be every bit as good as a swim school, but there isn't that quality control. So they could also be awful. They could just be mm -hmm. 30 minutes of, uh, monitored playtime and, and, if that's what someone is looking for, that's, that's fantastic. And we fully support people being, um, you know, in, in the water and, and developing that, that love for the water. But like, we're, we're really trying to hone in on our first three levels are safety, you know, a lot of rollovers, a lot of um, getting their breath and, and a lot of back floating. So, you know, sometimes if a kid really doesn't get a back float, you know, parents are like, Hey, we're, in, we've been in level three for two or three sessions now. And we're like, well, you know, like a back load is a really, really important skill. Like he, he's got to, you got to get it down. So, and we're going to, we're going to focus on it. Do you ever have to deliver any tough love in that moment where you're like, yeah, but it's not my fault. Your kid sucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, for those ones, I go into chat GPT and I, I say, Hey, chat GPT, this is what I really want to say. Uh, please soften it up for me. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Not all kids are cut out for swimming. They're not all Nathan Adrian. What, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> no it's not that it's not you it is you know i will say though you know there is uh, like you get in there and there is inherently just like some buoyancy differences and it's it is really interesting to watch you know like some kids are just so like the second i get them in just like moving them around the water getting them acquainted i'm like oh no <laughs> this is gonna be a tough one but like they, they get it they figure it out like it's really like when you get again, like coming down to like actually developing like your your like ability as an instructor like you get them into that back float and the way that we hold them, you know, we're, we're lightening up our hold, lightening up our hold, lightening up our hold. And, and, and as you are lightening up your hold, you can feel them make these micro adjustments because obviously they're trying to breathe. They want the water. Or they want this part of their face, you know, connected to the air. They're making these micro adjustments. It's really cool for me as, as an athlete to like see that, see their body learning, see their nervous system being like, Oh, I got to press down on my, on my lungs to float my, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, it's really a neat thing. Yeah. I'm really curious to know how, you, you know, your swim lesson transition works from, like you said, first level safety, that's st phase one, but then transitioning into actual swimmers and maybe into the swim club, you mm -hmm. know, how are you working on kind of molding their strokes, keeping in mind kind of where they're at, obviously, and maybe where you want to go. I know, you know, there's pretty common progressions out there, but then there's some off the wall stuff like 
good old Dr. Rushall who did USRPT, he had <laughs> the idea of doing reverse shaping where instead of, you know, thinking about, you know, we usually teach the entry of freestyle, then the catch and the pull, actually working on the recovery first for the athlete because that's the easiest least resistive motion and then working backwards through the sh stroke to learn the technical elements as how you're learning but also how you're wow. perfecting your skill over time so yeah obviously a little different probably than than what most are doing but what are you specifically doing at your program and and how is that kind of evolving yeah i mean we're not we're not that we're not there yet that's for sure we i mean we are we're we're teaching like again, those first three strokes, we just call it scoops and kicks, right? Their recovery can be over the water. Their recovery can be under the water. It doesn't, doesn't really matter as long as they can move, get on their back, float, and then get back on their stomach, move to the wall, get out of the wall. Um, once level four is when we, um, that's when we're starting to teach something that looks like uh, freestyle. Um, and that's going to have a lot of, we, we call them arm circles. Again, it's not, we didn't like, reinvent the wheel here this is this is a progression that ann curtis invented and you know nearly 60 years ago we're doing a lot of arm circles just working on that uh that muscle memory we do a lot of them on the wall um making sure they have a nice big uh, we do we definitely teach an open arm recovery you know uh that what like just big arm circles we got to come all the way out big big like a rainbow straight arm all the way out all the way to the front um, and then definitely a catch up stroke, uh, just not because we think catch up stroke is the end all be all, but certainly when teaching, um, it helps stabilize the body and forces them to, uh, to lean on that kick a little more. Um, and they don't, you know, drop their, they just don't go, uh, vertical when they're, when they're breathing quite as much if they have that good catch up stroke. Um, but yeah, that's, that's level four. Level five is when we really, we, Take a t we take our time teaching real side breathing, you know? Um, and, and again, I think that's like what we are like known for is that like, Hey, listen, like the, if, if you want to come for level one, two, three and, and, and end and, you know, your kid can get around and be safe in the pool and um, navigate, you know, just jumping in, falling in, get to the wall and get out. That's totally fine. But you know, levels four, five, six, that's when we're talking about like freestyle and we're, pretty strict about it. You know, it can't, you can't be lifting your head when you're doing side breathing. You gotta, you gotta be actually turning your head to the side and you gotta make it, um, all the, uh, I think it's about 30 feet for crossing the deep end, um, in our, in our level five class. And then the past level six, you're doing, you're doing a full 25 of good, uh, side breathing, of backstroke and then breaststroke. Um, that is not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. So Luke's going to be a level pressure. six. I have <laughs> to join a club. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, I want to I want to get to a question about what separates you. What what defines you as a as a clinician, as a coach, as an instructor? Um, I I used to always get asked, "Is so and so a good coach?" And I can never answer that. I say, you know, if there are ten qualities to a coach, so and so has six of the ten. This other person has a different set of the six, you know, they, they know their sport, they're good with people, they, um, they know the rules, they have a good eye, they have patience, they are behavioral psychologists like Mike Bottom, you know, and there are all these different components and everybody has like a little mix of, but not everybody has all 10, I used to say. Um, and I coached for a very long time, um, all sorts of levels. And, um, and I never went to coaching school, you know, I never, like nobody yeah. taught me how to coach. I just learned from my own experiences and my own experiences under tons of coaches on under them being coached by them and being on deck next to them and then i try to shape the luke paddington style of coaching and then learn from my mistakes i always brought my own self to the pool deck i made tons of mistakes and people advised <clears> me <throat> um you have had such a range of experience um, um under coaches with coaches and with other athletes and and all over the world what is what can one expect with when nathan agent comes on deck um, so somebody who's never met you and to be coached by you, what can we expect? Oh man, that's a tough one. Hey, yeah. geez, geez. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I actually did something really similar to what you did. Um, and, and I actually talk about it all the time, at least in my swimming career as my 2008 experience of being on the Olympic team, <clears throat> I, that was just me trying to be a sponge, you know, like I knew that I knew that the, the best I could possibly do. And obviously I was focused on doing that was trying to make that relay final, but I knew it was a long shot, you know, <laughs> but I knew that like long-term the best I could do is watch. And this is like, 
I, I think I think this, uh, the people on this call will appreciate this, but this is like the peak of American dominance in swimming, man. We had Aaron Pearsall. We had Brendan Hansen. We had Ian Crocker uh, on the men's side, along with Michael Phelps. You know, <laughs> like Michael Phelps in his absolute prime getting eight gold medals. Um, and then on the girls' side, we had, you know, Natalie. We had Dara. Uh, we had Katie Hoff, who, you know, was, was looking at making a bunch of um, Olympic medals at the time. It was just like a really, really cool time to be part of Team USA and um, watch how – those athletes went about being the athletes that they were. And, and for that, I would like, I would get to watch and I would get to see something that they did. I get to try it. And then I'd be like, Nope, not going to work for me, <laughs> you know, or, Oh, that's, that's something that I can totally like subscribe to. That's something that I can create and, and emulate in my own routine um, and then make it my own. Uh, and I was able to do that a good bit with, um, you know, with the, with the coaches that I worked with a lot of times when we're talking about like, how do, um, how to, I, I, you bring up Mike and man, he is, he, I love the passion and fire and in, in his speeches and his, his, that is very contagious, I think to his athletes and even watching some of the, his videos online. I'm like, Oh man, I remember those that like, even at, even at, you know, five forty five in the morning, uh, getting ready. Uh, you, you know, it, it would just fire you up. <clears throat> and then, you know, Dave was a leader in, in, in a lot of a different way, uh, but could get a group going in the same direction and rowing at the same time, like no one I'd ever seen before. Um, so it, it is, it's kind of taking little pieces of this and that. Um, <clears throat> and then I think um, when it comes to like, like coaching, coaching, like I'm not, I'm, I'm on deck usually with, uh, with one of our groups once a week, I would like to be more of like popping into and seeing every one of the, every one of the groups, um, a little more as, as opposed to just being working with one group. And I think we're moving towards that this summer. Uh, but I, I kind of just want to, I, I'm lucky. I just kind of want to do the fun stuff. I want to work. I want to see them on their quality days. I want to see, um, uh, I want to see them swimming fast. I want to be able to like get a little, catch a little video of them and, and, uh, and just point out certain things. Uh, that they can be, they can be doing a little bit better. I, I, I tell you what, I, I let me answer my own question because um, I've known you for a few years now, and you know, <laughs> because a, a, a guy who has five Olympic gold medals isn't necessarily going to help my child learn to swim, um, you know, and and, and 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 learn to breathe or learn to turn over. I think it's a guy who has um, the ability to communicate and get down to that level almost a par parental figure to be warm and friendly, speaking a language that's, that Michael Phelps understands and my daughter, Ezzy, who's nine, understands. It's a guy who is this uh, very um, uh, charismatic and, 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 and friendly and open to kids. I think that's what you would bring to the table when you come on deck. You sort of light it up. Um, and I think that's a big element of coaching is being able to speak the language you have the encyclopedia, but being able to speak the right language to the person. We you say, guys, yeah, all right. I, I, I totally see what you're, uh, I, um, I do my best. <laughs> Sometimes what? it takes an extra coffee or two, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, it is, that is, that has probably been one of the, one of the, especially at the beginning, one of the interesting transitions is going from like, you know, having these high level conversations when it was like Josh Perneau, Tom Shields, Ryan Murphy, and we're just sitting there stretching and we're talking about, you know, hey, do you see like this guy and what they did at European Championships? Oh my right. gosh, their stroke. You know, we're talking about this really high level stuff. And then bringing it back down and being like, oh, that's right. And looking through video archives and then showing a 10 year old, you know, um, a zones champion. I mean, he's a good, he's a really good swimmer, but being like, Oh, just take a look at this. Look at this video of uh, Bryce Mefford swing backstroke. Right. You know, he's not the strongest guy out there, but man, he just like catches so high up here and he just moves past his hand. And you, like not going into too much technical detail about body position or kick timing or anything, just letting him watch it okay. and, and like him be like internalizing it and be like, hey, think about that when you are, uh, think about that when you're swimming. Um, so as not to over overwhelm him with too, too, too much. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the um, how how difficult it is to switch levels because there's levels of technical detail that are appropriate based on like how advanced your skill set is. And when you're talking to a 10 year old, that's a very different skill set than, you know, someone who is in the group of, you know, great swimmers that you just mentioned kind of shooting the breeze. 
Um, and that, that's that I have personally found that to be difficult. I mean, we always did lessons in, in the summers through, you know, Auburn swim camps. And uh, I, I remember uh, and, and that's kind of like my experience to draw upon. Um, it's always a little foreign to me to get back into that environment of teaching a, a swim lesson. And you kind of realize the a level of expertise that you have, the immense library of swimming knowledge that anybody who's kind of part of this conversation or listening to a podcast about swimming probably has is they've got like a, a pretty robust um, understanding of stroke mechanics and, you know, drills, et cetera. But like there's different levels to it and it's hard to be able to relate to a six-year-old to an eight-year-old to a 10-year-old to know mm -hmm. like what what mm -hmm. they need to hear uh that's going to help them translate that to do a skill really well um and i just think you've probably gone through that learning process of okay how do i to tailor this message to the athlete so that it's going to maximize kind of their outcome based on the time that we have together that's that's a difficult thing to kind of get into Yes. One thing I learned was to shut up. <laughs> when I was <laughs> with, with the, like, and I think Sergio Lopez told us this too. When he gets a new athlete on deck, he doesn't talk to the athlete for two weeks. He just observes the athlete hmm. and then figures out what does this athlete need from what I can see. And he, he's all about, you know, symptom and causes. But I learned on deck, look, just just stop and, and scale back and you give me too much information and just just give much less and, and, and focus on specific things. And that's early in my coaching career and just give that one effective thing to change on work on. Yeah, and it, it's a hard thing to do because I mean, the money information we have just on this call here, we could write encyclopedias, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And, and just, say, just give that one. Yeah, I think you're totally right because I think we could all like uh, we would all independently see someone's video and we could all come up with four different things on their stroke they would have to correct. And if all four things are probably right, but it's just the first thing that pops up in our mind that when we see it. You mentioned watching video with some of the swimmers on your team a few times here. Could you tell us maybe how you go about that with um, some of the, the swimmers on your team? What levels you're doing like video and video analysis or I don't know. I'm just curious kind of where where technology is on the club level within within a team as far as ease of use, beneficial, what's beneficial, what's not. Um, That's a great so, question. That's yeah, a great question. Of, what is, we're uh, honestly, yeah. we're like not, we're not at the cutting edge quite yet, but we talk about it all the time. Hmm. Our, our head coach, John Hyatt, man, I mean, he is as knowledgeable as, as anybody because he act, <clears throat> he swam at Auburn for, for Richard. He swam for Brett. He, uh, and then he transferred up and, and swam um, with, with Mike Bottom for a while. So, it, you know, you talk about like having a, a range of experience and amazing head coaches. Uh, he, he's got it. Uh, and, and him and I, we talk, we talk about video and stroke all the time. But, you know, our, our core group is still pretty young. Um, and we're not, we're, we're still fighting the good fight of getting them to show up constantly and, and, you know, not take a two week vacation right at the end of school and, and kind of mess up their, uh, their end of summer, summer meet. So we're like, in some ways it's like, how do we use video as like an incentive, you know, to, for, for those who are really dedicating themselves to the sport and, um, and, and want to get better and not as like a substitute for training. Uh, because again, like everyone here, I think we know, like there is no substitute for training and putting in a lot of hours in the, uh, in the pool, just shaping your engine. Right. And, uh, and I think that there's this paradigm, uh, today, uh, where it's, it, they kind of think of it as, as golf where it's like, Oh, I just need, I need private lessons. I need private lessons. I need private lessons. I need private lessons. And, you know, certainly private lessons do help and they can help shape, uh, you know, a mentality I think especially when you find someone that you connect with really well and, you know, in, in the private lessons, if you have that, like that relationship, it can be like a level of like mentorship too. like, Oh, I know how that feels. Oh, you know, we, we talk about the quits, you know, yes, I am a eight time Olympic medalist. I had the quits when I was your age. This is how I dealt with it. Uh, you know, uh, just so they don't feel like isolated in, in having those feelings and like that dissonance of like, wait, swimming is something I want to do, but, I also want to hang out with my friends on weekends. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I guess that was a, a long winded um, answer to saying we haven't figured it out yet, but I will say, um, I mean, I, I don't have any, you know, formal relationship with them or anything, but go swim is actually a, a great, uh, they, their new app. Um, their little, their, um, 
the, the annotation tool is super easy. And, uh, and really like to Luke's point, I make that mis I make a mistake of like going into way too many things at once because like, I, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, we've gotten as far as we can get working on that. Let's, let's look at something else. We've gotten as far as we've gotten at, at like, we've gotten as far as we can get in one day looking at that. You got to take that home, work on it. Let's look at something else. But that, that can be reasonably effective if you get a little footage of it and then send it home with them, right? Like maybe three, five, three, 15 second clips be like, hey, you're totally over rotating on your turn. This is what you look like. This is what it should look like. This is where the line should be. Boom, send it away. That's good. Okay, you're, you're, you're crossing over on your entry. Um, you know, I want you to not cross this line. And, you, you know, with that, with that annotation, it makes it super easy and, and really nice. Hmm. I definitely think with video, like you said, having kids be able to watch stuff over and over has been one thing that's really helped to progress the sport. I mean, we all know 20 years, 30 years ago, there wasn't YouTube. There wasn't, you know, like you said, the Go Swim app that has all these videos to, you know, continue to kind of build that outside of that pool. So I'm still surprised, you know, video use isn't used more in, in club swimming at younger ages where it's almost just like as silly as it is, just like a TiVo, just taping them swim, it shows it at the end of the lane. You get to watch yourself. I know probably all of us had it except for Luke because, you know, they didn't have TVs back then. But most of <laughs> us had like TVs or TiVos that we use maybe for a dive every now and again yeah. at, at, at workouts. But it's still, I think, underutilized for such a simple tech in, in personally. But it's, it's hard uh, hey, to do I totally agree i to i totally agree i think that uh, for me it was like <clears throat> it was looking at it was swimming wasn't on tv as much youtube wasn't as big of a thing so i would see these like national level swimmers at nationals uh once a year and then we'd go home and be like this is my cleat keller stroke you know this is this is my michael phelps stroke this is my jason you know like uh -huh. and that was kind of our fun thing uh -huh. that we would do and talk about in practice uh -huh. i remember where Go ahead, Luke. I was going to say, it's, it's really hard to do technically wise. And I find Michigan recently did it how I always wanted them to do it. You want to do a dive. And as you dive, you look up and you see what you did right away and go and do it right away. So you need the instantaneous feedback. You don't want to like have practice, dry off, go home and see your tape. You want to like, you want to finish the wall, look up, say, crap, let's do it again. And Michigan has a really good instantaneous way of doing it. Maybe, it will, but that's an expensive mechanism to have that instant playback. Like, Bam, bam, go again. I remember this is a bit of a fall from grace uh, for uh, Sean Hutchinson, but he was like working on this uh, um, company with, <laughs> yeah, I, was that what it was called? I remember when they came to Auburn and they like, we watched this, um, they were like virtual reality goggles and we watched, I think it was Beyondy. Um, and you had this view of Beyondy's stroke underwater. And it was all blacked out and all you saw was this video. And we were just laying there on the pool deck watching this on loop, like perfect technique freestyle. And then they gave us these uh, goggles that were just blacked out. Like they had just covered them all up and you couldn't see anything. And we got in the water and tried to and just swam. Like you weren't trying to do anything. You just swam freestyle. They didn't tell you like try to swim it like you saw in the video. You just swam, which was kind of nerve wracking because you swim at 25 freestyle without uh being able like you're blind essentially and it's like a bit of empathy too for blind swimmers by the way because it's like oh it hurts to hit the lane rope <laughs> and you don't know where the wall is but you but then they filmed us doing that and when we went back and looked at what our freestyle looked like after having watched this loop and then swam blind freestyle it was unbelievable the technical changes that took place so it's kind of disappointing to me that that company didn't take off because man it was like immense gains and it's so powerful that i never isolated the video in the way it's like one thing to watch a video of yourself um not from a first person view and like try to make technical changes but this was like a totally different way of changing like making technique changes that was almost kind of like subconscious in a way it was it was wild would it be but, a first person view of beyond or was it like a third person view it was like I can't remember if it was like there were, had been a camera taped on his chest or if it was almost like, um, you know, you drive like a race car, uh, uh, like a race car video game where you can either have the first person view where you just see the road or you can okay. have the zoomed out view where you see yeah. the top of the car. Yeah, I think yeah, it was yeah. like one of those two. But whatever it was, it was like, you know, you could see his catch um, kind of in front of you. But like, cool. I don't know. So, yeah, really cool. I, that was I would drop some, some nerd history because that's my role. Um, back in the 90s, Turetsky's um, guy came to McGill when we were training 
and he introduced two things. One, he introduced the paper and the goggles and diving off the blocks, totally blind and swimming, and it's the scariest thing in the world. But he also brought the first underwater camera that rolled along the side of the pool. And he was, and Turetsky was doing that. And, and the head of the Russian Science Foundation came to McGill to work of our medical department, whatever, and do it. It was this big monstrosity, VHS tape deck recorder, you know, yeah. pipes underneath. <clears throat> But it was the first time that you were able to follow along the swimmer and they were doing it in Russia and they came to Canada to do it. Um, and I, I thought it was, it was fantastic. And this is the mid nineties. So, you know, how much- You know who's a, who's a master at his craft of uh, videography in, in the water is Russell Mark. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, it is unbelievable how fast he can, I've seen him, I've seen him run two GoPros along the side, avoid a, a ladder and then continue on and uh, and film the rest of it. So he's getting he's getting the in water view, above water view, and then before the swimmer is like done doing a hundred warm down, he's already like Wi Fi uh, the the footage back to an iPad so they can take a look at it. I mean, that is um, it's not an easy thing to do. I'm clunky when it comes to the the GoPro yeah. app because you got to you got to connect to the Wi-Fi and then you've got to transmit it to the app and it doesn't automatically save to your phone. So then there's another step of saving it from the app to your phone. And then, you know, it's like this whole thing. And he like chops it. Oh man, it's, it's really impressive watching him uh, work with that. Dude, Nathan, you're just preaching to the choir with Luke trying to explain to me and John how to use video <laughs> equipment. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. We've got, we've got the expert. Knows. We've got the expert <laughs> and then the total amateurs. <laughs> Well, couldn't agree more with the GoPro and the app. And also, just like you said, taping while swimming is an art. That's for sure. Uh, it takes a lot of practice to be good at it and not fall in the pool. Yeah. or actually, And keep them actually in frame. <laughs> well, talk about instantaneous feedback. And by the way, personally, I can't stand having the coach in my ear when I'm <laughs> training. I can't imagine having that. But we see it all the time. And I would not want that. However. Well, not the dirt and whistle. Over and over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Luke, what are you doing? Pick it up. I'm like, I can't. No, I don't want to hear that. Um, <laughs> I would want to. I would want to like see myself in my goggles. I would. I would be amazing. You know, I love mirrors. I love. I love putting mirrors on the floor, and I love going over the mirrors and streamline. Mm -hmm. And I wish a whole lane line, lane could be mirrors. And often we we get like 15 meters of mirrors, and it's awesome. Um, and I love to put a snorkel on, so I'm just looking down as much as possible. But can you imagine having that display in your goggles of video? But, you know, I think we're getting close because we are getting really good um, um, display in goggles for a number of years now. Uh, you guys, uh, but because goggles is all about seeing. Number one, periphery. Clear, see around you, unobstructed, without messing with your racing. But if you can then layer our technology in the goggles, that's the way we're going. And a number of companies are pushing that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're not there yet with like a 3D rendering. Maybe with uh, with Apple's uh, VR headset coming coming out soon. Maybe we'll we'll get a little bit closer. But right now, I mean, uh, with Finis, we have a we have a smart goggle product that's that's been really awesome uh, for me and and my you know what I call training these days and and definitely uh, with with coaching as well. Um, it, it's basically just everything that we were hoping <clears throat> that you could get in a smart goggle product. Uh, where it's just a running time clock <clears throat> in that uh, in in that little unit. Mm -hmm. It has an accelerometer, so it can sense when you're pushing off. Uh, it'll give you also it'll uh, it'll just give you splits for everything too because it can sense when you're doing your flip. Um, and then for those that are interested too, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, for those that are interested too, we uh, there's that head position um, mm -hmm. aspect of it when you actually sync it up to your phone. Um, and, and I'm certainly not, I, I, I don't have a perfect head position, but my head position is, is, is good enough right now, but I, I have used it, you know, with people that are just doing this a lot mm. and you can totally see it, which is really helpful. Cause you're like, Hey, you're moving your head a bunch. Like you gotta, you gotta like keep that still. Like this is the bow of the boat. You're going to follow whatever, you know, wherever it's pointed and you know, they're doing all this crazy, you know, headless chicken thing. Um, it, it's really you know, to, to your point with the, with the, the video feedback and being pretty instantaneous, um, it's really helpful in, uh, in, in showing them that and being like, no, this is data straight from an accelerometer that's attached to your goggle, um, you know, giving you that. So it's so funny to me that it's taken this long for, and I, I still, I don't think that it's taken off completely yet. Um, the use of smart goggles. And I think it, maybe it took a little bit for the technology to get there. And I, 
like I've got a pair of the Finis goggles here and um, I've used those. I know Luke used the form goggles before and I've, I follow triathlon. I've seen, you know, um, a lot of triathletes using them, but not necessarily pure swimmers. And one of the things that I think is maybe more innate to other sports is like um, triathletes and runners use a, a running pace watch. People who ride bikes and cyclists, they like live by their um, their bike computer that's got tons of data that's it, it, like, I'll ride on my bike and um, set it to a, a climb setting. And I know the grade of the road that's upcoming. I know how far to the top and I can like meter my effort based on what's coming. There's like lots of different data points that are coming in that are impacting the workout. And I just think swimming hasn't had that. I mean, I've told the story on, on the pod before, but my sister, I got into swimming because of my sisters, my older sisters. And um, I only found out recently that uh, my sister Haley quit swimming in part because she, her vision was so bad that she could not see the pace clock. And so she didn't understand that swimming practices had intervals and she never saw the clock at all she just pushed off whenever anybody else pushed off and it was like constantly reactive which is so crazy for us to think about like that's what the experience was like is she didn't know what was going on and that impacted her enjoyment of it but like the flip side of that is as much data and information as you can possibly have know how fast like know the the length of time you've been swimming the pace you're going the splits that you're getting in real time and not have to stop and, and look at a watch. And it's like, it's actually surprising to me that smart goggles haven't taken off more than, than they have, but it, it's, it's not ubiquitous. I'm just curious, like, you know, for, for you, how do you, how are you using them uh, today? <clears throat> so, th I mean, there's two ways, one for my own swimming. I just, I just love trying to see what the fastest time I can get is because it's just fun. Um <laughs> Two, I mean, after after the uh, after after going thirteen zero and a third thirty three and a third, I realized that I probably do need to go hit some hundreds sometimes, and you know, actually develop my or, or you know, try to regain a little bit of aerobic capacity. Couple Sadly. days of intermittent, couple days of intermittent fasting, you'll be there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I I do think exactly to your point of why your sister quit is the engagement piece of looking at the clock, right. Or looking at the clock, right. In your, in your eye and know, like knowing that there's like something I'm working towards knowing that something I'm doing like is, is like, is changing. It's getting better. You know, we, we can do, um, you know, and, and doing, doing sets that are designed a, around maybe the entire group, um, hitting a, a goal for the group and then every every week though that you know for me for us it's like um uh, some the group that i'm working with is you know eight to like 11 year olds right and and that is the piece that i'm working on exactly is, is that engagement piece getting them to start using intervals um looking at the clock um like starting to understand that if they try hard in practice that they get better as a group um and you know it, it's like doing uh a, a number of fifties kick with fins uh, on a minute. And, you know, if, if uh, the group as a whole goes a certain number of them at 45 seconds or below, then we get to do like power efforts, you know, where just like, you know, trying to do my best Dave Durden impression. I can't do the whistle thing without <laughs> using my fingers, but get them all excited again. You know, they all, the, 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 the race horses like to race, you know, and it's a lot of fun. They get excited, but they have to earn it. And they're realizing, Oh, like every week we're doing a couple more like and it's getting a little bit harder so then they're learning how to modulate their effort too right because if maybe they only made like two of the four uh based off of how they're you know using the clock like oh that first one i went a 37 and then i went a 44 and then i you know i wasn't making it anymore maybe that first one i can be a 43 i can be a 43 again and then i can get a 43 you know like being able to do that and having the <clears throat> having a heads up display and being able to do this like that to see what your, your time is, um, is, is really helpful and useful to, because it's, it's just there. It's just always something that is, you know, there for them to use as they need it. And then their, their main vision isn't blocked, uh, at all when they're just regularly swimming. Hmm. I, I want to talk about my experience with a smart goggle and I haven't had the finish experience and I want to compare the two. So the, the, the form goggle here I have, John and I, we did a review of this three years ago now, right in the height of COVID. And we were in an endless pool. And we also swam outdoor in a pool very similar to your AC swim club, a very small pool. 
Um, I, I liked it for being able to see in daylight. I like the fact that we had a polar heart rate sensor on my temporal lobe so I, I can get my heart rate going, which didn't give me the display, but it did go in the app and, and give me my calories. Um, the splits were fairly accurate um, on my turns um, and, and it was a running clock, fairly accurate. I'm saying like it would, of course it doesn't count kicks, which I couldn't stand. I want to be able to have a goggle that, cut, that measured your kicking, right, as long. Um, but what I didn't like about the goggles was it's, it's big and clunky. I wouldn't dive with this. Um, it, it was expensive. Um, lucky we got a model. Um, but we conclude that these goggles were really, really good for endless pools because endless pools are so freaking boring when you're just staying in place. But if I know how long I've been going for and, and I, can, I, can, I can play with my heart rate and I can, I can, I can go along with that, it really, really keeps the endless pool swimming a lot more interesting. So I'd recommend it for that. What I from what I see with the finesse goggles, the, the 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 profile is a lot more streamlined, right? It's a lot, it's a lot, it's more like a regular pair of goggles, snap mm -hmm. in, snap out, easier to use. And then of course the heads up display is um the heads up display, the um the head movement display is fantastic. And I think that's gonna lead us to a lot more derivatives. So um Brian, bring up your pair there of your finesse so the audience can can Right, so you see, I mean, you can see the difference. Now, now, granted, this is three years old, so I don't know if this changed their profile, right? this particular company. But um, yeah, John, what was your opinion of the form when you saw it? Yeah, very similar. I mean, very large, could actually feel it when we were swimming in endless yeah, pool. Endless pool is a little different just because it has, like I said, the, the water flow. So the form goggle definitely had that. And, you know, I think one thing for the smart tech to keep figuring out is what's the important information, what's too much information, and who is it for each swimmer or like what's important for each swimmer at every different level? Like Nathan said, you know, I didn't even think about it till you mentioned it, that, you know, the engagement component, these could be part of that equation to continue to keep kids engaged and motivated in a sport that we, we know we lose a lot at that pivotal nine to 13 ish age, because it's maybe not the most fun. It's not as much team oriented. So I think a smart, tech and all these smart things continue to come out it's figuring out how to use it for each person and and what is actually helpful totally <clears throat> actually luke i have the last couple of races i've done i just clicked the little module out and i i have done the races with uh with the goggles no problem no problem it's good mm -hmm. yeah because we all have our, i'd love it could be ubiquitous across any goggles because the goggles i love right now are the magic fives because i just love how they fit in my face and they're very comfortable mm -hmm. but it's such a low profile there's no way a module can fit in there so it really is a balance of engineering to get the two you know the, the low to your face and it module in there um it, it's, it's spot on i would I would love to know if we are allowed to race in it. I saw you recently did a show where you, I think you can race with it, but you know, classic breaststrokers and backstrokers look at the clock sometimes to see what their splits are in a race, right? Could they you imagine totally how do. racing would evolve if, I mean, track you see it all the time. R runners in a, in a track can see their splits. You imagine how swimming would evolve if you knew what your splits were when you're racing. <laughs> right. So the, uh, we did get a clarification on that. You cannot, um, yeah. it, it can't, it'll show your pace, Mike Unger. Uh, okay. clarified that for us. So you cannot currently under the rules, uh, race waste with them. Yeah. It'd be an advantage or different. I think that's silly. Well, one thing I was thinking about as we were talking about this was okay. Like all the focus on the athlete and you know, how helpful it can be for an athlete to have more information, but also coaching. Cause when I, I remember I never really coached swimming. I was on staff at Auburn doing operation stuff for a few years while I was, uh, still competing in swimming. And every once in a while, I'd pop on deck whenever, like, the pros weren't swimming, but the college team was, and I'd, like, help out with splits or something. And that was one of the hardest things for me to adapt to uh, with a stopwatch is being able to, like, get splits. And we all know how often coaches would mess up splits. <laughs> and it's and the thing is, it's, like, really hard to get splits for everybody. And it's like, Nathan, 24-9, you know, Brian, 24-7. Of course, it was faster. And... Um, <laughs> But like, if you if if you could get splits on goggles to be accurate, and yeah. you could kind of sync those all in a single database, maybe even in real time as it progresses, then coaches can watch swimmers, you know, just watch the swimming and coach the swimming instead of having to play the, you know, um, facilitating the workout role. That would be so cool to get to that point where you don't have to mess with that on the watch and you're just like, the data's there. You know, we don't have to track it anymore manually. 
Totally. Totally. I, I totally agree. And I think the cool thing is the, <clears throat> the splits from the Finis ones are really impressively accurate. As long as your start is consistent, your finish is consistent, right? You gotta, you gotta understand the limitations of the technology here. It's an accelerometer, yep. uh, on, on your goggle. If you're going to, if you're going to stop, look up at the, look up the clock, keep moving your head, it's going to kind of maybe confuse it just a little bit, but if you stop, hold it for a second, like, or just like kind of look up, um, and, and just like stay still, make sure that it's very clear that you're done, man. It's, it's as accurate as, uh, as anybody on a, on a stopwatch, especially from like from effort to effort, because you know, your push off consistent, your, your finish consistent, it's not going to be like, and that's one of the things that I love about it is like, it's not one of these things where if you're in a group of five people starting, you know, one person's going to drop on, you know, the seven, the next person's going to drop on the eight, you know, and I was always, I was always like strict about like dropping on the nine. I'm like, well, when did Dave start the watch? Did he start it for the, the guy leaving early or did he start it on, started on my foot? And I, I don't know. So I would like always try to validate it. And now, you know, the goggles do it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one thing, John, Dr. John, the PT told me is Luke, Strava is the is what gives me in income. Strava um, makes runners go past where they should go when they feel an injury. Oh, I just got to get to four miles, like three point seven. Like, I did say that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like and sometimes you just got to turn off your splits. And I've been running now a lot more. We're just we're just turning off the my, my mile splits and and be surprised or how and enjoying the love of the sport. And, then, and and naturally it's coming because it's danger also too much data too much pressure on yourself too much crap i had a really bad workout again i don't know it, it could be dangerous so sometimes you got to fall and remember why we're doing this the love of racing just sprinting because i want to beat nathan i don't care what time he went he might have a broken you know what i mean the love of the sport you're still in it you're still racing you're still um you know, I always wondered if you had come second at trials in, in 2021, where would you be now in the sport? Would you, you know, you have a family, you have a beautiful daughter, Parker, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and, and you've, you've had, you've had life now after swimming or is it after swimming? Or you still have a life? What's the last, what's, what's <laughs> the love of swimming for you? That's a good, that's a good question, man. Um, so to, to your point though, I think that's, that is spot on. I, I do want to uh, caution the, the danger of, of the latching too much onto, um, onto the data at, at Cal, there was, especially during taper time or as we were getting more, um, more geared towards race pace and performance, like there would be days where Dave turn, doesn't even turn the clocks on. And I, I think that there are days that, you know, in, in theory, you should just pop that module out or just not turn it on at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and think about your feel or think yeah. about what the objective of that practice is that day. And it, it, the, not every day can be a, a, a day where we're going, you know, race pace or, or super fast times. Um, and then to your point about uh, Nathan Adrian's life, man, I am still so wildly in love with the sport of swimming. Yeah. But uh, as we talked about cognitive dissonance before, I am very aware of the fact that I cannot do it the same way that I used to do it. I have, uh, you know, I, I have, I have two kids now. So we have oh, uh, Parker and we have Brooklyn yeah. um, and I, I, we have a wife and uh, we, we, I, sorry, I have a wife. <laughs> the, the girls have a, have a mom um, and, and, you know, swimming in professional athletics is just such a incredibly selfish endeavor. And it, it really is not, it, it, it was awesome. <laughs> like Brian, we like Luke, we, we loved it. I'm sure like I get, my job is to eat healthy. I'm going to go to this fancy new restaurant and get their kale salad and feel good about it. And, you know, if I have, you know, a teammate there uh, and we're, we're talking about our next, uh, you know, a clinic or something, I can call it a business expense. Um, so like it was, and is such an awesome, awesome journey. And when we do things like masters nationals, or I get a taste of it, like uh, the Olympic club showcase, you know, uh, like just, just putting on a suit and going through the, the motions of warming up and then getting those butterflies pre-race. And um, I, I just, I love it so much, but it, it is not something that I think I can reasonably do at least the way that I know how to do it um at, at that at that level because it's it, it, and that didn't even didn't even mention like a, a business uh and that is uh that's a that's a we're getting there like will and i are getting so much closer to actually like being business owners uh but we 
at the beginning and currently we, we bought ourselves a job just to, to be clear. <laughs> uh, you know, like, I mean, we were, we were digging post holes, mixing up concrete, fixing fences, fixing gates, uh, doing, doing this, that, or the other, uh, driving the truck to the, the air gas to, to do the CO2, uh, replacements because, you know, delivery charges got crazy expensive during COVID. It, um, like I said, we're, we're getting closer, but that's like, you know, that's kind of like one of the things that's so attractive about swimming. I'm sure we can all relate to this is like you invest into it and then you see it grow and you see those improvements. And that's like why that engagement piece of like either the, the, the smart goggles or teaching your, teaching your young athletes to pay attention to their times is, is so huge and so critical. Cause like you see that, uh, that improvement and you're like, I want, I like, how can I do it better? Uh, that, that's all, in all of our natures. And, and like, we're again, like we look at where we are now versus where we were last year with the business. It's like, Oh, we're like, we're coming out of the bottom of the J shaped curve. We're not, we're no longer going down. <laughs> um, and, and we still have a long way to go, but that's, that's certainly, um, where I get a lot of like, you know, that desire to grow, to improve, um, I, I get that a lot of other places now being a dad, being a husband, um, and, and being a business owner. And, you know, I, I certainly wish I could just go back and relive engaging in that 100% of, of my mind, body, and soul into, into swimming, but it's not a, not a part of my life that I think I can realistically do anymore, but I can still swim fast, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> I'm right. Oh. I can too with, with some really big fins. Um, <laughs> I got a quick question for you before we jump in some rapid fire. Um, I remember a number of years ago, a friend came up to me in California and says, look, I was just up in Marin County and I went to this club and they had this big poster of this swimmer. And I think he's famous. I wonder if you know him. Like, Maybe. What's his name? I'm Nathan something. Nathan, Nathan <laughs> Adrian. And I was like, yeah, of course. And it, it made me realize that, you know, a lot of people don't know who you are. And even more so as, as you live in the sport. And so it isn't how much is what, what's the one advice would you have that you've leaned on to build life out of swimming business? Because mm. it's less and less becoming your name It's less and less becoming yeah. Nathan Adrian. Mm. I mean, we, John Neighbor shows up on deck. People don't know who John Neighbor is. Do you know what I mean? Uh, anymore. Mm. And he was the, 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 the stud of the 70s. So what are you leaning on now? And what advice would you give to lean in to be successful, to keep your life in swimming? Yeah, man, it's, it's hard. It's hard No, And I don't know anybody who's done it perfectly, but it's like, it's, it's part of life, right? It's part of this, this road, road we, we call life. And uh, to your point in 2012, after I qualified um, every, you know, after every time you walk in and out of uh, the, the, I don't remember what it was called back then, but the, <laughs> the, the trials pool, yeah. I, people were hounding me for autographs and Grievers and I were just signing, signing, signing away. And I'm like, corner of my eye, I see someone tall and I'm like, that's Matt Biondi. No one is asking him for an autograph. He is the man. Like I want to go ask him for a picture right now, but I, I can't get there. <laughs> you know, like, and that was pretty eye opening to me. Cause I was like, Hey, this is, this, this ain't lasting forever. Like enjoy this, be nice to these kids and you know, it, like do your best to inspire them. And mm -hmm. you know, they're going to go on and do great things, but this is not something that's, that's yep. a, a forever kind of deal. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I think I think learning how to engage and disengage uh, into something, into things that you're doing is, is really important. Mike Bottom gave a great speech about compartmentalization mm -hmm. uh, my freshman year at Cal. And it's just like, hey, like you're at practice, you engage fully in practice like you're at uh, you're at study hall. Like, actually, go ahead and try to study, try not engaging in the social aspect of it. And then when you when you are trying to be social, then you don't have to worry about any of the school pieces. And, right. and you know, like. I like, like to like put on different hats when I was doing the different things and like doing when I like, I, I do love the saying where it's like swimming is something that you do, not, not who you are, but like in some ways pretending or engaging in that piece or that idea that swimming is who I am while you're at practice is adaptive, you know? And I think, you know, George was so good. Uh, George Bovell, a you know, mutual friend of, of all of ours was so good at, at engaging in that piece and saying, oh, yeah, I am the alpha male. I like, this is my job. This is my duty. Uh, and this is who I am. Like you stand on the top of the, the mountaintop and, and let everyone know. And, and like, 
I love that. I love that piece. Cause I was like, George, I'm 19, but man, I want to beat you so bad. And then he's crushed me every time, you know? And, and like, enga- again, and engaging in that piece. And then like going and spearfishing with them afterwards yeah. and then barbecuing, you know, some lobster tail and like hanging out with my buddy, mm-hmm. uh, was, was, was really important. So I think that, um, I, I don't know the the actual uh, the actual real best answer to it, <clears throat> and I do I do understand that saying swimming is not who you are is something that you do, um, but sometimes just pretending, to, just getting yourself into that into that mindset, being a, a little bit of a chameleon, and then you can kind of chameleon your way out of it yeah. uh, on, on the weekends and completely disengage because that's when I that that's when I was like I don't. And, and one of the things I think actually was was really beneficial to our our, our group and our community at Cal, because we were trying to do things that, you know, at Cal we hadn't done in 30 years and winning in title. But like on the weekends, not, there wasn't a peep about swimming uh, mm-hmm. that, that was mentioned. Maybe we would talk about like, uh, uh, oh, God, Dave was so mean at that practice. And then we'd like work on something else. You know, it, it really wasn't like we weren't like looking at other uh our, our our splits or videos or anything it's just like completely disengaging from the sport of swimming until you know six o'clock uh monday morning when we were we were back in the water all right man a few rapid fire questions we'll let you go sweet let's solve it here floaties or no floaties oh are, are we are we being serious about learn to swim because i definitely um uh-huh. have, have an opinion on that yeah uh, so floaties are floaties are tricky. They'll uh, they'll they'll treat you the they'll, they'll show you that the uh, the vertical position is okay uh, because you can float in the vertical position when you have water wings on. Mm-hmm. Not to mention that idiots like me and all my friends when we were kids, even when we were good swimmers, we thought it was cool to put floaties on our ankles. <laughs> like I mean, <laughs> I mean it was just like come on, dude. So there are specific floaties that are that are meant to to get people like uh, children horizontal. We don't use any of them in in our in our programming, mm-hmm. uh, but like we like the first thing you got to do is is teach a kid how to be comfortable horizontal in the water which is why like i was talking about before that that back float is is so 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 important the second that they this like perfect back float yeah we're great we're ca- we're catching our breath second even you get your hips out of line that's when we're starting to do a little bit of the bobbing and then and then we freak out and that that uh writing reflex because like when we are um i guess when we're we're kind of like fight or flight panicking we want to get our head upright. Right. And mm-hmm. it makes total sense when you're on land. Cause I want to see if there's a tiger chasing me or, you know, if there's a bush I can run in and, and, you know, hide at or, or whatever. Um, uh, but you, you really, really have to fight that, um, in, in the pool when, if the pool is a place of panic and that's why like our progression is being really comfortable on their back. Like I'm like our earliest, earliest progression, I'm bear hugging them, right? And like singing Twinkle Twinkle to them, making sure they know I am here for them. Um, so long story is, is uh, you know, it, it can be a useful tool, but it has to be monitored. It's like training wheels, right? Like mm-hmm. it may, may be getting them in, but get rid of them pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. A, a very short interjection here. You mentioned George Ravel and we're talking about goggles. George Ravel's mother is one of the reasons my both my kids can swim because he she said the best way to teach a child to swim is to put on scuba goggles. It doesn't matter what goggles, but scuba goggles and in the bathtub, just have them in the bathtub. And that's how George Ravel learned to swim. Literally just like in the bathtub, exploring the bathtub. And goggles are the way to have the kids not be afraid of the whole world that's open under the water. And, and you get it in the notes with mask, but, but goggles is what helped my kids get to swim. And I started it off in the bathtub and it's due to George Bavel's mom, Barbara Bavel. So it's up. That's awesome. Great, great shout out there. And you know, one of the other things for me too, is like the cool thing for me with Parker is that now, like after taking her in and working on some things, like she practices her back floats in the water in, in the, in the bathtub. So it's kind of like this yeah. place where you can, where you can yeah. practice. And then on top of that, I, I do what I can, like, to try to like, I go and pick her up from daycare, and then sometimes I bring her back so she can watch our uh, our senior group work with work with Coach John or watch some of the lessons because like that's the first step of learning is is that visual watching other older kids doing yep. doing something that you want to do, and she's like, oh, I want to go swimming now, you know. All right, Nathan, we'll keep this going. Some rapid fire. What makes what time gets top six in the hundred free at Olympic trials next summer, men? Oh, uh, dude, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. The hundred, the sprint is sprint freestyle is, is weird right now. It's it's going back to the, 
it's going back to like looking at um, athletes that aren't primarily sprinters, like looking at making, making that team again. Um, and I'm not sure if it was real or not. I, I, did I see a, did I see a thing where Blake is coming back? Um, oh, is he? I don't know. I, maybe that was a dream. If, if, uh, <laughs> if he is, that would be, he, that would be great for, for team USA, not just because he's a great athlete, but he's a great guy and really lightens the mood and it, it's a good, good leader for that team. Um, uh, man, I, I, I want to say a 47, but I don't think so. I, I, I think it's back to like a 48, two or so something, something like that, which is, um, I don't know. Is it enough to get it done at, at the Olympics? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Well, speaking of, uh, what are the odds that team USA gets their million dollar bonus for the relays? Um, listen this is like we, I, this is the third time I'm, I'm mentioning dissonance and uh I'm, I'm not betting parker's education fund on it but i want to see it happen for sure you know it's like of course i want i want to see it happen but like there's a reason why they can put that money up and use it as use it as incentive it's not it's not free you gotta earn it and uh you know what's really cool is uh, I, I, I hate, I hate try, ragging on team USA in, in the way I feel like I'm doing right now. Can we flip that to say, Hey, look at, have you guys seen how fast Reagan's swimming? Um, and like, listen, Crazy. we're, Crazy. yeah, it's really, really cool. Yeah. Oh, and and uh -huh. I think that, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, maybe, uh, 2021 wasn't her thing, but 2024 is certainly shaping up to look like it, it might be. Yeah, and gosh, who? What a better? Could there be a better person to to root for and see this? Exactly. Gosh, exactly. she's so great. She's so great. Um, okay, uh, what was the one race in your career that you learned the most from? Oh, uh, two thousand eight finals of uh, Olympic trials. Man, that uh, I, I, I again, I, I have I've like done entire I've done a forty five minute talk just talking through this story. So I'm going to shorten it really, really short this time. Basically, Brian, Brian, you, Brian, you were, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Brian was, uh, was my roommate at short course world championships where I, I like, I won. So I thought I was hot stuff, but really, you know, world championship short course, especially in 2008 meant absolutely nothing, but it meant a lot for my confidence. Um, so then I go to trials, um, and I don't do as well as I wanted to in prelims. I don't do as well as I wanted to in semifinals. I end up having a swim off. I don't do as well as I want to in the swim off. And I'm like, what the heck? Like I have been training so hard. I really haven't dropped a ton of time. Uh, but I make it to finals finals. I drop. I think it was four or five tenths of a second from my, my best time before that. And, and, you know, like, like I had genuinely thought I put everything I had into each of those races before then. Um, and then to drop, especially like, at, you know, at the same meet a, a day later was just so eye opening for me being like, it, it's not, it's not over till it's over. Right. Even if your meet is not going well, uh, your first couple races aren't, aren't exactly what you, what you want it to be. Uh, you know, your, your next race, it might be the one. Man, that's amazing. What a, what a story. I remember watching that race uh, vividly being there, seeing you make that team. So, uh, yeah, what a cool moment. And geez, mm -hmm. what a, what a great kicking off point too to the career you had. All right. What's the, what's the best, uh, current world record on the books right now? Oh, you know what? For a long time, I was saying it was, uh, Michael's 4am, but it's not looking like that one's that safe for that much longer, but, uh, Aaron's, uh, tuner back looks pretty safe for a while that one looks sick all right last one how often does uh, ac swim club do social kick oh <laughs> it, as often as uh as often as often as they earn it it's uh <laughs> it's a positive feedback man you got it like they it's not it's it has to be i don't know yeah yeah it's not it's not something it's not a uh it's it's a privilege it's not a, it's not a right i guess <laughs> Well, it's our privilege today. Thanks for hanging out with us again, man. Always good to talk to you. All right. Hey, you guys, thank you so much and uh, and keep doing what you do. I can't wait to, to come and hang out with you guys again. All right. That's it for this episode of Social Kick. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website.